from his throne. If you would, let's stand together because today's title is Getting a Grip When We Remember Our God from Malachi chapter 3. And we looked at chapter 3 verse 10 last week. Today we're going to look at verses 7 and 8 specifically. Let's look at what God has to say about remembering. Verse 7 says, Even from the days of your fathers you are gone away. And some translations, maybe your translation says, have forgotten mine ordinances. And look at what God has to say. Return unto me, and I will return to you, saith the Lord of hosts. But you said, wherein shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, wherein have we robbed thee? And God responds, in tithes and offerings. Let's pray together. Father, help us, Lord, to remember your statutes, your ordinances, and your ways. Father, I pray that we would remember that you are the Creator God, the one who spoke and created all things. Father, I pray that you would remember that you are the one that sits on your throne in glory, and that all that you've created belongs to you. Father, help us to remember the day that we were saved, born again. And Father, I pray that if there's someone here that doesn't remember that moment in their life, Father, I pray today would be that day that they would receive you as Savior, that they would be forgiven of sin that they would be committed to live for you. Father, I pray that that would be all of our prayer, that we would be committed to you in every area of life, with our time, with our talents and ability, with the treasure that you have entrusted to us. We pray this in the wonderful and the strong name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. You may be seated. Well, remembering. Memory is one of the greatest attributes of living. Well, I'm thankful for my memory because I'm able to remember many of those key moments in life that I treasure in my heart. I I pray I remember the good things and, and the good outcomes because they help me to do the things that are right because I learned that if I do the right things, I have good outcomes and I hope I remember that when I do that which is wrong, I feel the conviction of the Lord. And, and, and wrong things turn out to lead to wrong results. And, and so memory helps us to learn how to behave. However, sometimes our memories fail us. Sometimes our memories fail us because of disease. Why, we may have had someone in our family that had Alzheimer's disease and Slowly, the progression of the disease led to to forgetting things and even who they were. Sometimes uh, a disaster can occur and someone loses their ability to remember. Uh, A concussion, a hit on the head, and the next thing you know, you have forgetfulness. Or some people experience what's called amnesia and, and forget altogether. And sometimes... We just get that disease called old-timers disease. You know what that is? Uh, I'm experiencing some of that. Uh, And and so they come on with that commercial on television for Prevagen, a a supplement to help you to to have brain health. The only problem with that Prevagen is, is in June of 2019, the Journal of the American Medicine came out and said there's no factual data to support uh, Any of those supplements really helping our memory, but just in case, some people like to take them. Uh, I tell you what, just in case, maybe save the money that you're spending on supplements and uh, and give it to the church. Amen. I I don't know, but but that's just what the Journal of the American Medicine had to say, and you may it it may help you with uh, foggy memory. Although sometimes it's not because of disease or age. Let's just be honest. Sometimes we just forget. Amen? Do you ever forget? 
You know, sometimes I forgot is not an excuse. Sometimes it's a reality. I just forgot. I forgot to make that phone call. I forgot to respond to that email. I, I forgot when I was walking out the door and somebody said, Pastor, remember I'm going in the hospital. That's why I ask you to write it down. <laughs> because a good note is better than a, than a memory, amen, because our memories will fail us. Even the important things get pushed out of our memories. It's because of that that we need to remember the work of God and the Word of God because that is essential to the people of God that we remember these things. We need to remember His work every day because God calls us that we would serve Him with our time and with our talents and ability and yes, with our treasures as well. Now let me share with you where this scripture is going because Malachi chapter 3, uh, Malachi is responding to the fact that the people had forgotten all of God's blessing. And today as we celebrate 105 years, we don't want to forget God's blessing, do we? In fact, just celebrating this day that God has given us, has God blessed you? We need to remember the blessings of God because, you see, after 70 years in captivity under Ezra, there was a revival. And, and, and God, His mighty hand moved to bring the people out of captivity. And you remember the story of how Nehemiah led the people back to, uh, to build, rebuild the walls and to care for the, uh, the people of God. And so God had blessed the people. He had brought them out of captivity, brought them back to their land. But how quickly they forgot their God. Why? They ended up going right back to some of the same sinful practices that caused them to get taken off into captivity. How easy the flesh desires what the flesh wants. Amen. You make a commitment to do the right things, and then the next thing you know, God blesses, and, and then you go back to the old ways. Can I tell you, your pastor's fighting the flesh right now, and I know some of you, oh, well, let me tell you about it. Because you've watched as, as God blessed me and as I lost 50 pounds, amen. And that was good for my ankle. And things are going along so well, but now those carbohydrates are calling me. And my wife will say, you know, you're getting back into those bad habits. I, uh, you're eating that stuff at nighttime. Man, the carbs just call on me, especially this time of the year because, you know, I, I was going through the grocery and I, I saw the, uh, the, the different cakes and pies. And uh, I took a pumpkin pie home. And then I looked at how many calories are in every slice of that thing. It, it, the, the carbs, you know, the, the flesh wants what it wants, doesn't it? And, and you pray and say, God, you know, I don't want to get caught up in, in bad habits or get caught up in bad behavior. And, and, and God will bring conviction. We'll say, God, I'm never going to do that again, whatever that is. And then the next thing you know, the flesh, the devil, amen, the world calls us back into, into wrong thoughts, wrong living. And that's what happened to Israel. Because they had forgotten their God. 150 times in the Bible the word remember comes up. It's a good thing for us to remember the statutes of the Lord. But one of the first things God's people were instructed to do was to remember to bring their offerings to God. From Abel to Noah to Abraham, over and over again, God called His people to remember, to bring the tithes and offerings to support His work. God's people were told not to forget the ordinances or the commands of God. They needed to get a grip on, on life and to remember God in every area of their faith. So let's look at three things very quickly. First of all, we need to first of all remember that our God is sovereign. Amen. No matter who the president is, no matter who the king is, 
no matter who is in charge, I'm going to tell you our God is still on His throne. Amen? Amen. Our God is still in charge. And first, and of, the, of incredible importance, we need to remember that God is a sovereign Lord who owns everything. I listen to what the Bible says, because the Bible says that God created all things. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's why the very first thing that the devil will try to undercut in our society and in the lives of children is to question whether or not God created. I'm going to tell you, God did create all things. And if you're here today, God created you. You're not here by accident. You're here for a reason. God created you and He loves you with an everlasting love. Why, the Bible says that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and all of they that dwell therein. In Psalm 24, verse 1. Why, in fact, the Bible says that all the silver and the gold in the world belong to God, according to Haggai chapter 2, verse 8. And I know what somebody's saying. Yeah, that's, that's my silver. That's my gold. Really? Well, let's wait a hundred years and see who it belongs to. Amen? Let's wait a thousand years and see who it belongs to. All things belong to God. Listen to what Job had to say. For every animal of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird of the mountains. And the creatures of the field are mine. For the world and everything in it is mine. Everything belongs to God. Would you agree with that? Everything belongs to God. And so if God owns everything, I know what somebody's thinking. Why tithe? Why give an offering if it all belongs to God? I'll tell you why. Because it demonstrates our faith and our obedience to God. You see, tithing and giving is not God's way of raising money. It's God's way of raising His children. Amen? He wants His children to trust Him with the things of this world. He wants His children to trust Him with their time, with their talents and ability, and with their treasure, and also with our testimony. It all belongs to God. And He expects us to be good stewards or managers of what belongs to Him. Let me tell you something. There are some people in this church. Can I talk about some people in the church? They're getting worn out because they're serving the Lord. And all too often they're serving by themselves because other believers and other members of the church aren't doing their part in helping. Amen? You see, there's a place for every person to serve and to help. That's what church is about. We are a family. And everybody has to do their part. And so what is your part in stewardship, in giving of your time and abilities? And what about giving of your treasure so that God's work is done and God's house is taken care of? And what about giving your testimony? Church, listen to me. There is somebody that no matter what eloquent preacher shows up, the only way they're going to be reached with the gospel is if you share your testimony and you share the witness of how God blesses your life and changes your life. Are you sharing? Are you carrying out the work of the Lord? Are you being a good steward with your time? and your talents, and your treasure, and your testimony. Now a common mistake for followers of Jesus is, we think, well, we give our 10%, and we get to keep the other 90% for whatever it is we want. Can I tell you something? That other 90%, it still belongs to the Lord. Amen? It still belongs to Him. You see, that idea that we give our tithe and offering, and then the rest of it, we'll just spend on ourselves, however we want to do it. Let me tell you, that leads to some sinful expenditures, maybe debt and materialism. 
But when we understand that all of it belongs to God and we're to be good stewards with the other 90%, that changes our outlook on money, doesn't it? It's not ours to waste, it's ours to be a good steward of that other 90% so that we can take care of ourselves, our family, and, and be good stewards of our investment. We manage it because God has entrusted us with it. You know, the parable of the talents is told in Matthew chapter 25 and Luke chapter 19 is a splendid example of how God was a manager. But he entrusted three of his servants to manage on his behalf and, and he went away. And when he came back, two of the servants had done well and managed what he had entrusted them with. But the third did not do well. And so what had been given to that third one who had mismanaged everything was taken away and, and, and he was punished. Let me tell you, God wants us all to be good managers of what belongs to him. Amen? Because he is sovereign. But now let me tell you what the problem is. We need to remember that mankind by nature is self-centered. That's our second big point. We're self-centered. Listen, if we're not careful, we will spend all on ourselves to take care of what we want, what we want to do. We'll take all of our time about what we want, what we want to do, because the flesh and the world and even Satan himself will do all they can to get us off base in being a good steward of our life. We need to remember our great susceptibility to self-preservation that leads to selfishness and sin. Listen, we have a responsibility before God to be good stewards, but the problem is, is, is selfishness. We're always thinking about what we're going to do tomorrow instead of what God calls us to do today. Listen to James chapter 4, verses 13 and 14. God says, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will travel to such and such a city and Spend a year there and do business and make a profit? God says, you don't even know what tomorrow will bring, what your life will be. And listen to him. For you are a bit of smoke that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Listen, we're always thinking about what we're going to do tomorrow. When the truth is, God has called us to be good stewards today. Let me tell you, life is fleeting. Kind of like the steam off of a coffee cup. Kind of like whenever you get that cold weather. It's almost Christmas parade time. I can tell by the weather outside. But I got up and came out today and I went like that. And I didn't see that, you know, that water vapor that you see on a cold day. And I said, well, it's not Christmas parade weather yet. But it's coming. Can you feel it? Amen. But, but that little vapor, it's just gone in a moment. And God says, that's what your life is. It's here today, gone tomorrow. You have today to be faithful to the Lord. Listen, God's sovereignty is why we need not and should not rely upon our own sufficiency. Because the truth is, we are not sufficient in and of ourselves. Self-sufficiency is merely idolatry in disguise. We worship ourselves. We think, I can do it. This belongs to me. This is my life. I'll do it my way. I told John Michael he needs to warm up his vocal cords to get ready to sing, I did it God's way again in December. Amen. Y'all like that? Y'all come back on a Sunday night. We're gonna, he's going to sing that for me because we're going to look at the life of David and, and that. But listen. Frank Sinatra is not the only one that thought he did it his own way. Amen? A lot of people. And like, by, by the way, church, some of you are new members. You're here today. At your funeral, don't have them sing, I did it my way. Amen? <laughs> That's a bad witness. I did it my way. Have John Michael sing, I did it God's way. Amen? But I go into a funeral and they're singing, I did it my way. And I think, oh, Lord. 
But listen, we want to do life God's way. Self-sufficiency is merely idolatry in disguise. We need to remember that God is our provider. Amen? Jehovah Jireh. God is my provider. God is my sustainer. Well, we must also remember that God is in control. Listen, He's in control of everything. Right down to the the birds and the flowers that He takes care of. Isn't that what Jesus had to say? Self-sufficiency is the opposite of living by faith. And remember what Hebrews 11.6 says from last week's message. Without faith, It is impossible to please God. It's not improbable. It's impossible. And so being a good steward of our time and our talents and our treasure and our testimony, let me tell you, that is an expression of our faith. Let me share with you an illustration I found last night on the internet and It was too late for me to get it into the PowerPoint, but I printed a picture of this fellow right here, Reverend Theron Rankin. Anybody hear of him before? Well, you're going to hear a story today. Because this guy really had a big part in our church history, modern church history. And if you can't see his picture back there, I kind of blew it up. It gets fuzzier when you blow it up. But this fellow right here, came from a poor family, and he had gotten saved in in a small little Southern Baptist church, and he grew in Christ, and one day he stepped out the aisle and walked down the aisle and said, you know, today God is calling me into mission work to go and share the gospel around the world. His pastor looked at that little urchin, and realized that that boy had come a long way in his salvation, but because of his home and because of the finances at his home, he couldn't afford college and couldn't afford to go to seminary. As that young man grew and prepared to graduate, the pastor went to a rich businessman who was the leading giver in the church and said, Sir, little Thera, He can't afford college. And I don't know why. God has impressed upon me to come to you today and ask you to pay for all of his college, his expenses, and all of his seminary. But I'm telling you, that's what God has called me to come here to do. The businessman, (laughs) sitting across from him, began to weep. He said, I'm so glad you came to do that. He said, more than 20 years ago, God had blessed me. And another pastor came and asked me to help a young youngster like that to go into the ministry. And I said, no. Because I was thinking about myself. Truth is, I'd have never missed the money. I'd have been blessed. Because that young man went on to be a great pastor. And I'm thankful I got a second chance today to be a blessing, to give of my treasure so that someone else could be blessed. Let me tell you the rest of the story about Theron. Theron Rankin went on to be one of our great Southern Baptist missionaries to China, following up on the work of Lottie Moon, who had gone to China. In fact, during the Second World War, he was put in prison for for his faith and for sharing the gospel. And when he was finally released from prison, he went on to be the the head of what was then the Foreign Mission Board of the Southern Baptist Convention, and now we call it the International Mission Board. Theron Rankin was so respected that actually there is a Baptist Association in North Carolina named after Theron Rankin. But what would have happened if that pastor hadn't been sensitive to the the Spirit of God calling him 
to go to another person who had the resources and, and could give so that Theron could go on to college and go on to seminary and go on to be one of the great missionaries in church history. Church, listen to me. We don't always get second and third chances. And maybe today you're sitting here today and, and a pastor is calling on you to, to once again examine your life. To get a grip and to remember the blessings, the way that God has blessed you and, and to call you to consider your giving of, of your time, your talent, your treasure, and your testimony. Listen, we need to remember it is by faith that we are saved. Amen? Listen, the third thing to remember is that we receive Christ by faith. Now, now listen, no one is going to be saved by giving money or taking your offering envelope and placing it in the plate. But we're not saved by our giving, but I'm going to tell you something it's by our giving we demonstrate that we really have faith. Amen? Right. It's by our giving of, our, of ourselves and our service. It's by our giving of our treasure and our testimony that we are giving a witness, not so that we can be saved, but if you're really saved, I believe the Bible says that it is going to be expressed in, in how we give. You see, it's easy to give lip service. It's another thing to demonstrate our faith by the way that we live. We enter the Christian life by faith. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that's not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Faith is the means by which we live out the Christian life. And our financial situation is part of that walk. And I know what someone here is thinking, but, but I can't give right now. You don't understand the trial, the struggle I'm going through. Listen, I'll never forget the night that our house caught on fire. And we lost everything. Never once did me and Donna say, well, you know what? We, 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 ought, we ought to hold back what we give to God. You know, it was during that same time that we were in the process of getting our home rebuilt and, and, and picking ourselves back up. And actually, the Lord picked us up. And I remember one morning, Don had already gone to work, and I was trying to get Darren out of bed, and he was paralyzed from his hips down. I remember picking my boy up taking him to the pediatrician's office where they told me to take him to the hospital. And I thought, Lord, what are we going to do? But God had his hand on my son. Last night, my son was able to go with me to hear Bobby Bowden speak. He's an associate pastor down at Southside Baptist. And, and, and you know, God put his hand of healing on my boy Listen, blessings are not always how much you got in the bank. Amen? Amen? Why, God blesses us in so many ways. And then when we went through the Great Recession, I remember watching men in our church who had lost everything. And they'd come in the office and, and they'd say, Pastor, I used to have 16 trucks out doing electrical work and I've had to let people go and I'm trying to help my employees and, and I'm down to running two trucks now and I don't know what to do and and I'm tithing, but, but you can't tithe on nothing. And what little bit I have saved, I'm, I'm trying to give so that, so, so that the church, we can keep the lights on. Listen, I was in a church that was primarily built by those that were in the construction industry, and construction dried up. And, and the truth is, uh, the staff, we went 12 weeks without a paycheck, those of us that were able to. And you know, God's still blessed. was during that time <laughs> that Donna was first diagnosed with lymphoma. I remember a doctor saying, you know, we believe that we'll get you five years in remission, but 
Don't plan on living more than 10. That was 13 years ago. Amen? Amen. Those people that only measure blessings by money are missing the boat. Our God is in control. He is sovereign and on His throne. And yes, death will come to every person. And the question is, do you know for certain that when you do die physically that you have eternal life and will spend eternity in heaven? You see, the greatest blessings are those that we receive by faith, knowing for certain that we have eternal life, knowing that our God is in charge and He's on His throne. So how are you doing with your grip on the Lord today? Let me conclude with this. Do you remember a time in your life when you knew for certain that you accepted Christ as your Savior? Now, I'm not asking you, do you, do you remember the exact date? Because I'm one of those folks, I don't know the exact date. I, uh, I, in fact, y'all ever sang that song, It Was On A Monday That I Received Christ? No, that's not the exact words. It was on a Tuesday. And, and you sing which day, and I have to wait until the end because it was on some day. Because I don't remember which day of the week it was either. But I know for certain on that some day when I was, when I was there alone with God, and I said, God, with all that's in me, I'm going to give all that I know of me to all that I know of you. Take my life. Do you remember that moment? Are you certain that if you were to die right now that you would go to heaven? Listen to me. Get a grip on your life and know for certain that you have eternal life. It is possible for a person to be saved and not know the exact date. But you need to remember that Jesus is Lord. Do you remember that? Do you remember that moment in time when you gave your life to Christ? You may not know the date, but do you remember giving your heart and life to Jesus? If not, Today is your day. Don't wait for tomorrow. Now is the time.